In the early 1930s, Rutherford's model of the atom was the accepted model of the atom. It was understood that the majority of the mass of the atom was contained within the nucleus. However, it wasn't completely clear what matter that mass came from. So protons were well known and it was understood that there was protons inside the nucleus. But this, it's just protons alone, didn't account for enough mass. So at the time, a popular theory was that as well as having protons, there was pairs of protons and electrons which together have a neutral charge to make up the missing mass. So this made sense to people at the time as beta decay of unstable nuclei have been, had been observed. So we'll be learning about beta decay later. But basically beta decay is when a nucleus emits electrons and as it breaks apart. So if electrons were being released from the nucleus, then it makes sense that there's electrons contained within the nucleus, which is where this theory of having electron and proton pairs inside the nucleus came from. However, there are some problems with this model. So as we know from the Schrodinger equation, if we confine an electron to a very small region of space, which is effectively what we're doing if we're confining it to the nucleus, then it has a very short wavelength, the wave function, which means that it has a very high energy. In fact, it turns out that this energy is of the order of 100 mega electron volts. And so this means that when these electrons get ejected from the nucleus, because they have so much energy, they need to be traveling at relativistic speeds. And this isn't consistent with what we observe from beta decay. The electrons released aren't traveling at relativistic speeds. Another way of considering whether electrons can be confined within the nucleus is to consider the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h bar on 2. If we're forcing delta x to be really small, because it's within the nucleus, then it means that delta p is very large, and once again we end up with very large speeds for these electrons. Now, some hints to what was actually in the nucleus came in 1930 when Beeth and Becker conducted an experiment where they bombarded beryllium and some other light elements with alpha particles. What they found was that a new isotope was produced and also some kind of radiation, which we'll call Y. This radiation was neutral and it, it was more penetrating than any gamma radiation which had been observed before. So remember, gamma radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So this was quite interesting. So Irene and Frederick Juliet Curie, so Irene Curie is Marie Curie's daughter, conducted some further experiments in 1932 where they took this radiation, this Y, and they slammed it into paraffin wax. So paraffin wax holds very loosely onto protons. So it's quite easy to release protons from paraffin wax. And they found that when they smashed this radiation into the paraffin wax, they were producing protons with energies of five mega electron volts. So they were then able to do calculations using Compton's scattering equation to work out that if this radiation, which they were slamming into the paraffin wax, was gamma radiation, which was the popular theory at the time, then that gamma radiation required an energy of 50 mega electron volts, which is a lot higher than was thought to be probable. So this result was no surprise to Chadwick, who suspected that this very penetrating radiation was not in fact gamma rays, but something else. So Chadwick conducted a few further experiments and then used the laws of energy conservation and momentum conservation to show that the particle within the nucleus was in fact the neutron. So let's have a look at an outline of how Chadwick performed these calculations now. So James Chadwick performed lots of experiments with different atoms, but what we'll consider here is the alpha radiation, which he slammed into stationary boron atoms, and this resulted in the production of nitrogen and the neutrons. So we can write down the reaction equation for this, the alpha radiation plus the boron. 
Now, boron and nitrogen are very good choices because the mass of them was very well known at the time. And this produces our nitrogen and the neutrons, which we'll call Y here. So then what Chadwick did was he applied the law of energy conservation to this case. So initially we've got an alpha particle here with some velocity v alpha. So this has got kinetic energy, mass of alpha particle, half the mass of the alpha particle times v alpha squared. And then we've also got our rest mass energy. So we've got the m alpha c squared. And initially we've also got our stationary boron particles, which also have a rest mass energy. So that's the mass of the boron times c squared. So this is the initial energy here. And then afterwards, we've got our neutron and we've also got our nitrogen. So let's start, we know this Y is a neutron, so let's give it the symbol little n now. So we've got the half times the mass of the neutron times the velocity of the neutron squared plus a half times the mass of nitrogen times the velocity of nitrogen squared plus mass of the neutron c squared this is the rest mass energy of the neutron plus the rest mass energy of the nitrogen okay so this is our energy conservation equation now we also expect momentum to be conserved so initially all the momentum is in the alpha particle so we've got m alpha v alpha and then after this collision the momentum is in the neutron plus the nitrogen. Now we know that the mass of the neutron is quite a lot less than the mass of the nitrogen. And so looking at this equation, we can see that vertically these momentums have to be equal to each other because this alpha particle initially has no vertical momentum. So if the mass of the nitrogen is a sorry the mass of the nitrogen is a lot greater than the mass of the neutron then this tells us that the velocity of the nitrogen has to be quite a lot less than the velocity of the neutron for them to have the same vertical momentum there. So if the nitrogen is going a lot slower than the neutron, then in this term here, where we've got the velocity of the nitrogen squared, this term must be very small. And so we can actually set this term to zero. So Chadwick used this equation then to work out what the mass of the rest mass of the neutron was. So just rearranging, we've got mnc squared plus a half Vn squared on C squared. This is, these are all the terms with an Mn on this side. So this is equal to a half M alpha V alpha squared plus M alpha C squared plus M B C squared minus M N C squared. And so everything in this equation is well known, the mass of boron, the mass of nitrogen, the mass of alpha particles. The speed of the alpha particle here is easy to measure because it's a charged particle and so they knew how to measure those speeds at the time. The only thing that he wasn't too sure about was the velocity of the neutron here. So James Chadwick, being a clever person, decided to slam these neutrons into different types of gases and in particular he tried hydrogen gas which is basically just proton nucleides so he slammed this neutron into stationary protons and he could then measure the speed of the protons and from the speed of the proton he was able to work out the speed of this neutron here so now everything in this equation was known apart from the rest mass of the neutron which was what he was trying to measure. So when he solved these equations he found that mnc squared was equal to 938 plus or minus 1.8 mega electron volts which is very very close to the currently accepted value. Well the currently accepted value is within this uncertainty range so today we know that this is equal to 930 
9.57 mega electron volts. So Chadwick was able to show that there was a part, a neutral particle within the nucleus with a mass a little bit greater than the proton mass. So mnc squared minus mpc squared, where this is the mass of the proton, is equal to 1.29 mega electron volts. So compared to the mass, this is a small amount, but the mass of the neutron is slightly more than the mass of the proton.